Um, good evening. My name is Meg Duguid, and I'm the Director of Exhibitions at Columbia College for the Department of Exhibitions, Performing, and Student Spaces. I want to welcome you to Water, Water Everywhere, First Person Flooding, Impact, and Action. This is the third program for Third Coast Disrupted Artists and Scientists on Climate, an ex as exhibition of newly commissioned artworks culminating from a year-long conversation between seven artists and seven scientists centered on climate change impacts and solutions in the Chicago region. It's a feat to put together an exhibition of all newly commissioned works and then add to that facilitating a discussion among 14 scientists and artists that both acknowledge the re very real effects of climate change while focusing on solution oriented ideas. For this, we have needed a village. This program was created through a collaboration between Columbia College Chicago, DePaul University's Institute for Nature Culture and Culture, and Terracom. We also couldn't have done this without our sponsors and supporters, and especially without the support of the Illinois Arts Council Agency and the Illinois Science and Energy Innovation Foundation. We invite you to come see the exhibition in person, which is located at the Glass Curtain Gallery at 1104 South Wabash. It's up through October 30th. So um, we also invite you to come online. If you, don't, if you don't want to come in in person, we get it. There's a global pandemic. Um, so you can visit us online at thirdcoastdisrupted.org and column.edu slash thirdcoast where you can learn more about the artists and the scientists involved, as well as see future programs. Um, before I kind of introduce Christine Esposito, our main curator, and um, who will then introduce all of our amazing panelists, I just, um, today I took, today is one of my few days, um, I have one day a week really, where I am not um, dual um, parenting while working full time. And what that means is I get to take a run by the lake near my office. And I was just, you know, thinking a lot about this, this spot and this program. Um, this is the spot by the lake right by the Adler Planetarium. And as you can see, it is truly water, water everywhere. Um, this spot has been underwater for a little, a little time now because the lake levels are rising. And in can kind of considering, you know, people used, used to walk here. Um, the other thing I was thinking about today when I got home is this happened. This is a rainbow over where I, near where I live in Little Village. And, um, and it's like the other power of water, right? Um, the power to kind of refract and create light and, um, and feel, feel hopeful. And I thought that, that those two things were really indicative of kind of how this show functions as well as um, what I believe this panel is going to be doing. Um, so now I'm gonna invite you to, um, for, for Christine to talk. Um, I'm gonna introduce Christine Esposito. She is the project director and lead curator of Third Coast Disrupted. Um, she is the founder of Terracom, a 30-year-old environmental communications firm whose exchange project brings together collaborators to create art and science initiatives like Third Coast Disrupted. And now, Christine, I give it to you. Thank you, Meg. That was a perfect lead-in. We're so excited for to hear from our panelists this evening, and it is my pleasure. I also want to thank you for choosing to spend some of your Thursday evening with us. It's my pleasure to introduce our panelists, and we'll go with Elena Grossman. Elena Grossman is the Program Director for the Building Resilience Against Climate Effects Illinois Project. Brace Illinois is a partnership between the University of Illinois at Chicago School of Public Health and the Illinois Department of Public Health to help prepare Illinois for the health effects fair has shown at the Museum of Science and Industry Black Creativity, Southside Community Arts Center in Chicago, and Joby Arts Center in Chicago as well. Along with the Global Art Project in Italy, Mexico, and Senegal, the San Francisco International Arts Festival, and Prism Art Fair in Miami. She works and lives between Chicago and Northern Georgia. 
Daniela Pereira is Vice President of Community Conservation at Open Lands. She serves on Open Lands Executive Leadership Team to develop innovative solutions to challenges facing nature and urban communities. Along with the Healthy Schools campaign, she co-manages Space to Grow, an ambitious 50 plus million dollar multi-year public-private partnership to retrofit Chicago schoolyards inclusively with school and community for health equity and increased climate change adaptation. And Deborah Shore. Deborah has served on the Board of Commissioners of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago since 2006. She was reelected to a second term in 2012 and a third term in 2018. She has been a strong advocate for cleaning up the Chicago waterways and for resource recovery, including the reuse of treated water and the generation of biogas. So welcome, welcome to our panelists. For our conversation this evening, we will start out with each of our panelists giving their perspective on our topic for about five minutes each. And then we'll have our conversation and we'll conclude with your questions. So again, alphabetical order. Elena, why don't we start with you? Hi, everyone. Um, you know, it's always, I feel like when, when you're in the beginning of the alphabet, it can be really great to go first. And it can also be really awful because you never know what it's going to be like. But here I am. So I'm going first. Um, and I'm going to pull up. Um, so Christine gave an introduction of who I am. I'm going to talk a little bit, very briefly, about not just how water and flooding is impacting health, but how climate change in general is impacting health. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the psychology of climate change. This is our friend Grover. He's doing his infamous near-far routine. And I like to use this gift to illustrate how psychologically we as humans have a hard time connecting with what is far away, right? So imagine um, when you're in a job interview and you get the dreaded question of where do you see yourself in five years? And we hate that question because it's really hard to picture where we'll be in five years let alone 20, 30, or 80, which is often used for climate change projections. We also don't necessarily connect with facts and science. Um, this is um, the hero from Parks and Recreation, Leslie Nope. She once said, all I have on my side is facts and science, and people hate facts and science. And this was about putting um, fluoride in the Pawnee water system. You know, we've seen this with COVID. We see this time again with climate change. People do not connect with facts and science, but people connect with their health. So this is an infographic that we created to show the connection of how climate change is causing a number of environmental changes in Illinois. We're seeing more frequent and severe heat waves, floods, droughts, and worsening air quality. And all of these environmental changes have huge impacts on our health. Now, none of these health conditions are new. What's happening is that it's exacerbating them. Climate change is increasing our risk of getting a number of illnesses or diseases or being exposed to um, threats that can harm our health. We also connect to people and to events. Um, you're looking at a number of different people who have been impacted by climate related events. The top left-hand corner is Dorothy Williams. She suffers from sarcoidosis, which is a disease that's attacked her lungs. So she has to be very cautious about air quality and monitoring it when she can go outside. To the right and bottom right are images of Pam and Tony Monsky. They live in Manuka, Illinois, and their home was really destroyed and devastated from the floods in 2013. Financial destruction, personal loss. Several years later, they were still working on rebuilding their home. And then the bottom left is from the 1995 Chicago heat wave, where over 700 people died. And this is actually an image of a mass grave because the Cook County's coroner's office was so overwhelmed with unclaimed bodies that they had to create a mass grave. When I think of mass graves, I think of war-torn countries, not a heat wave in the city of Chicago. And then finally, it's really important to think about how all of these impacts will disproportionately affect certain populations. So I'm sharing with you a study that came out about a year and a half ago 
uh, showing that the white population actually cause more air pollution, but the black and Latino populations are exposed to more pollution. Now this is just air pollution, um, but black and Latino communities also often live in communities with fewer green spaces, fewer trees, more concrete and more asphalt. All of those built environment conditions increases the risk for heat related illnesses and all the public health implications from flooding events. And to really ensure that we protect our community and thinking of our community as everyone, um, we, want, we need to ensure that those who are at the highest risk are protected, are a priority in protecting their health. And I think I'm passing the baton now. All right. To Mashani. You know, I should say, I'm sorry, Mashani, to interject. Elena is one of the scientists in Third Coast Disrupted. So we, our artists got to hear her vantage in our conversations and Mashani is one of our artists. So Mashani, please. Oh. Mute. I was saying first is hard, but second is harder. That's not muting yourself out. Um, goodness. I'm one of the artists um, that uh, not only experienced a lot of the issues that Elena just brought up, um, but they've been very um, pivotal in a lot of my work. Um, I consider my work environmentally. Um, awakened work. Um, majority of my um, materials are recycled or repurposed. And we'll just go into the presentation. So the title of my piece is called Breathing to the Next Breath. And it speaks to um, what Elena was saying about the fact that Black, Brown, and Indigenous populations um, are experiencing the hardships of our consumerism and um, depleting of our natural resources. Uh, this is the natural water cycle um, in an urban area. And uh, ever since I was little, I've been fascinated by science and weather. I always watched um, WGN for the weather. And um, Tom Skilling always explained everything so um, thoroughly that it, it, it's been something that was a lifelong interest. And what we find is that a lot of our rain water doesn't have a place to go. We don't have enough green space in certain areas. I grew up in an industrial area, so it was um, really lacking in ways to retain water. But, I'm sorry, I have to jump like this. My grandfather um, had a garden and he pretty much took all the areas around us and turned them into food. Um, the first picture with the little, my little cousin is the garden as it was um, 20 something years ago. And then the second picture is what it looks like um, about a year ago. So it's still a green space that's collecting water and allowing it to um, evaporate back up. And it's one of the fewer places still left in South Chicago. This is what Chicago looked like in the beginning. And many of the areas of South Chicago, of, of Chicago are um, marsh or swampy uh, peri lands. So they're not necessarily made to be built on, but industry pushes and pushes reshapes the river, um, so forth, to the point where our natural way of being is disturbed 
uh, many of our ancestors, our indigenous ancestors, knew how to live within the land. More modern man um, sees it as just something to take over and, and brutalize almost. So this is the house that we um, experienced our first major flooding in. And there's still, there's green land and everything, but with the infrastructure system that was hundreds of years, 100 years old or more. And with the fact that being in a, um, a more black brown area, we weren't able to get a lot of the upgrades in areas where the tax bracket is a little different. And so here is um, some of the last images where we lived um, in the house I just showed. And that was the basement. This is one of the uh, fellow artists, Meredith's watercolor um, rendering of our basement. And back then we assumed that it was just the infrastructure, um, poor management. We never connected climate change to it. And to this day, I read articles and I'm not seeing a lot of connection to climate change. So a lot of people really don't have that um, understanding that our actions elsewhere are affecting our homes and our communities. Um, just got two more slides. Um, this is a demographic of um, the population is vulnerable to environmental issues and exposures versus the um, blue um, map, which shows the density and population of um, African Americans. Um, a lot of those areas are brown, black, and indigenous. And if you compare the two, you can see that those areas are the most affected. So it's not something that we're just assuming or is. is vague, it's actual factually there that our areas that um, black and brown people live in in Chicago are highly contaminated or um, more exposed to um, toxins, flooding, and other issues um, caused by climate change. Do I have a few more minutes? This is a simple diagram, um, but it basically shows what um, black mold, which is what we experienced in the flooding growing in our walls, um, how it affected us. I still have allergies. Um, I still have reactions um, to my allergies, such as um, skin breakouts, things like that. Um, my eyes and um, nose are better, but my eyes were always irritated. And that was just from uh, minimal exposure. So if people stayed in those houses uh, with black mold for any longer, um, they would start to get more infections um, thoroughly, more sick. And if they have like diabetes or heart, uh, pre high blood pressure or heart issues, um, that can affect it. So climate change affecting our weather and environment have a long-term effect, as Elena said, that people are probably more um, understanding about versus, you know, polar bear bears, you know, floating on an iceberg, unfortunately. So this piece um, that's in the show is a ring of mold, that's an image, and each piece in the, um, center represents stages of what I went through, um, being exposed to it, living through it, and trying to work through it in the end, present day. Um, some of the material used is, um, has mold spores in it, it's sealed, so it's protected, no one will be harmed. And a lot of the images came from the basement um, flooding. And I'm concluding there.
Okay. Thank you, Vishani. Um, Daniela. All right. Does everyone see my screen? Yep, great. So I'm going to try to give you an overview of the Space to Grow program within five minutes. So let's see how we could do. So Space to Grow is Chicago's green schoolyards program. We transform underutilized asphalt schoolyards into spaces that provide students, their families, and the community with safe, shared green space. So this is good for outdoor learning. It's good for active play. And at the same time, it utilizes green stormwater infrastructure to reduce flooding in under-resourced communities in Chicago. Open Lands and Healthy Schools campaign co-managed space to grow, working with the partners and the school communities to ensure that everything becomes successful. Uh, Open Lands ultimately is really focused on connecting people to nature where Healthy Schools campaign is looking to support healthy students. Capital partners are the public agencies who provide the leadership, expertise, and the funding. Thank you. <laughs> These partners have specific motivations for participating in Space to Grow. Both the Department of Water Management in Chicago and Metropolitan Water Reclamation District have mandates to use green stormwater infrastructure to get water into the ground and out of the sewers, especially during the peak rain times. Chicago Public Schools reinstated daily recess and daily physical education in this last decade, but they didn't have the proper infrastructure at many of these schools to get kids to get outside and actually use the spaces. With more than a thousand acres of impermeable surface, these schoolyards presented a significant opportunity for changing the way stormwater is managed on public land in Chicago. We have committed to transform 34 schoolyards by 2022 and to develop a plan to scale from that point on. These schoolyards will be able to capture and hold over 5 million gallons of stormwater at any given time. They will serve over 15,000 Chicago Public School students and their families providing access to nature, outdoor classrooms, space for physical activity and recreation, and edible gardens for, uh, to help support nutrition education. These schoolyards also serve as community parks after school hours and have been found to promote community cohesion. This is based on some of our researchers' findings, physical activity, and a stronger connection to nature, especially in areas that are park poor. So, so far, we've installed 25 schoolyards. Um, they're serving 10,500 students right now in their communities. And the schoolyards are selected in communities with the highest risk of basement flooding, the greatest need for infrastructure improvements, as well as pressing need for safe green space. The selection process also utilizes CPS's equity index, which prioritizes schools for infrastructure improvements by looking at factors including income, race and ethnicity, and the history of investment in those areas. The school and communities uh, have to request these and apply for the program. So that ensures that the school really does want this and it's not something that the city um, or county is trying to push on the school. So if it's desired by the community, they will apply for it. And once it's selected, we work with each of the school space to grow committees, the late local neighborhood organizations, and local elected officials to ensure broad engagement and make sure that the parents and neighbors are also engaged. The community input and priority are our specialty, I would say. Um, we capture this information through a variety of strategies, 
um, you know, to get as many voices as possible. So it's not just the students, it's not just the teachers and principal, but we actually go and reach out to the nearby neighbors to come and get their, their input on what we want to develop with them. This process also provides multiple opportunities um, in multiple languages. Uh, if we need to, and we also try to make sure that if there are power dynamics within the school or community that we separate those to get um, anonymous feedback. Each Space to Grow schoolyard receives $1.5 million in transformation. And every space uses special surfaces and design elements such as rain and native gardens and permeable pavers. This helps capture the storm water and reduce neighborhood flooding during the heaviest of storms. Our space to grow schoolyards are designed to replace those hard surfaces with gardens and materials that instead soak up rain right where it falls, filter out pollutants and slowly release the water back into the sewer system. This means less basement flooding for neighbors and cleaner water for our rivers in Lake Michigan. We don't just plop the schoolyard down and run away. The role of both Healthy Schools campaign and Open Lands is to ensure that the schoolyards are actually being utilized and activated and cared for, um, and also then to support any kind of athletics and uh, academics too. So we provide some professional development training get for the school staff so that they know how to utilize the outdoor space, especially to utilize it for outdoor um, time for studying um, or education um, and, and training their students. Um, but also we teach the neighbors about the stormwater uh, capture, how to mimic some of those practices on their own properties and then we do a lot of nature-based education for students. So in addition to addressing climate resilience, the benefits of these green schoolyards for children living in these underinvested communities of color are remarkable. Um, they've included improved health, decreased stress, and improved academic performance, along with less bullying um, and reported less basement flooding from the neighbors. And all in all, uh, the benefits of, of these green schoolyards is pretty remarkable when you think about how much uh, land um, public schools in general all over, all schools all over in general have with uh, asphalt play lots, parking lots, and being able to think about how to transform that into more green space and at the same time capture a lot of stormwater is a really strong and great investment. And this is something that is being modeled not only um, in Illinois and the United States, but we also are, um, have these uh, alliances with Paris and the city of Rotterdam to share our best practices with them. And that's it for me. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Daniela. Deborah. Well, thank you everyone. Thanks, Christine and Meg and welcome uh, this evening. I'm so delighted you all joined us. I do not have pictures to share with you, but I'll try to paint a few with a story I'll tell. And I am not a scientist or an artist. Uh, I was a writer and editor before I took the unlikely step of running for public office. The Water Reclamation District, uh, is the agency that was founded in 1889 with a mission of protecting the drinking water for Chicago by keeping sewage out of the lake. And I want to go back a bit in time because our water story here begins about 15,000 years ago when where we are now in Chicago and Cook County sat under a half a mile or more of ice the last glacier extended this far south and not much farther. And imagine a half a mile of ice. It's heavy. And as that glacier slowly recedes to the north, it scours the landscape. 
and leaves an enormously rich mix of soils. It leaves glacial ridges and moraines. It leaves giant ice cubes that as they melt create prairie potholes and it leaves a very great lake. But because it was heavy, it compressed our landscape and left a compacted clay layer under much of the soil, which inhibits infiltration of rain and water. And as Masani pointed out, there's really nowhere for water to go. There's no real downhill. The highest point in Cook County is about 600 feet above sea level. So we can't pump water away from us because there's no real downhill. So that's the, uh, uh, we have to contend with. And we live in a very wet land. Uh, in fact, I'd like to point out that Chicago is the largest city in the country whose name connects it to the native landscape. It was the Potawatomi Indian word for the nodding wild onion that grew in profusion right along the riverbanks and that grows here still. So we had marshes and wetlands and mucky, soggy places, and we began building a great metropolis and protected the water supply by digging a canal and reversing a river to use water from Lake Michigan to flush our sewage downstream. And for 130 years, the mission of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District was to treat that sewage and protect our drinking water. In late 2004, the Water Reclamation District received authority to manage stormwater for Cook County. Previously, that had rested with the county government and by an act of the legislature that was changed. So now the district has authority over two of the three pieces of our freshwater ecosystem namely used water and rainwater. We're not responsible for filtering and treating and providing drinking water. That's the City of Chicago Department of Water Management. And I also want to note that the sewers that were ultimately laid under our city streets to convey waste and dishwashing uh, water and laundry water and toilet water from our homes are owned and maintained by each municipality, not by the Water Reclamation District, which has larger intercepting sewers that receive the from each city and convey it now to sewage treatment plants. But those sewers were built in Chicago and 50 of our older suburbs to combine both the waste from our homes with the rain that falls on our landscape and streets that flows down the street drain. So it mixes with sewage. That's called a combined sewer. And as you can imagine, a pipe can only hold so much water. When it fills up, that either backs up into our basements, and I live in Skokie, it's happened to me several times, and it's happened to Masani, it's happened to people all over Chicago and Cook County, uh, because our capacity for rainwater is limited, but it was also designed to overflow when it's full directly into a neighboring river or stream. That's called a combined sewer overflow. And it's not a good thing because it means we're dumping uh, pollution, the salt and oil and contaminants that lie on our city streets, bits of brake dust and pet poop and dirt into our rivers and streams and diminishing water quality. So 50 years ago, the sanitary district conceived of a tunnel and reservoir plan to try to reduce these combined sewer overflows and improve water quality in our rivers and streams. And they began digging what's called deep tunnel, which four sections of deep underground storage tanks, essentially 33 feet in diameter to, to capture these combined sewer overflows through drop shafts instead of dumping the water into our rivers and streams. The tunnel was completed in 2006. 
It can hold up to two and a half billion gallons of stormwater overflow and three reservoirs are also part of the system to reduce flooding. Two and a half of those are complete and ultimately capture many billions of gallons of stormwater overflow. But the, the challenge, as Elena and others have said, is that with climate change affecting our region is expressing itself through more intense rainstorms that are highly localized, less predictable, that dump an enormous amount of water in a short period of time that overwhelms the capacity of our local sewers to be able to convey that water to the deep tunnel, to our reservoirs, to our treatment plants. So how do we peel back, as Daniela was talking about, some of that concrete skin that we've laid over the landscape and give our land as much opportunity to capture and absorb water as we can? That's one of the challenges we face. Excellent, thank you, Deborah. Welcome. I I want to um, sort of step back. We I'm going to combine two questions um, that tie all of these things together um, for the sake of time. And and panelists, you can choose which of the two questions you would like to answer. It kind of backs up to um, something, Mashani. You had said that you know you all the flooding the the chronic flooding that you experienced in your home and, and these health effects you and your family you related to the infrastructure of course it was related to the infrastructure but you didn't connect it with climate change um nor the health effects actually so uh to what elena was saying so what my question to you panelists is are you seeing that people are connecting the dots between our increased uh, intense rainstorms and flooding, as you referenced, Deborah? Are people connecting the dots between that and climate change um, at, in your observations? And likewise, are the health effects on people's radar screens, both citizens and decision makers uh, in, in planning solutions? Um, I'll start. I think, yes, they are connecting it to climate change. We just had the wettest May on record that followed the prior wettest May, which was from 2019, that outstripped the prior wettest May, which was 2018. In the last decade, we have had several of the wettest years on record. And of course, Lake Michigan was flirting with its all time high. People are, are aware of water in many ways, I think they hadn't been. The, in terms of health effects, I think it's a more mixed it's, it's more complex because it's not just the contaminated water that can happen with a sewage backup from uh, in your basement and that has caused mold that has bacteria and pathogens in it as well and is itself is a health threat but there are all the acute stresses that accompany a basement backup that have to do with loss of treasured heirlooms and dealing with insurance and smell and and dealing with destroyed things and that lingers and so there's not only the issue of, of health, but about well-being. And I don't know that we are paying enough attention to those kind of stressors that accompany uh, these expressions of climate change. I'll kind of piggyback on that. Um, you know, as I think Deborah had said, you know, Illinois has experienced flooding for ever, really. Um, and in my experience in talking to particularly local health departments throughout the state, I talk about all the health effects from climate change. And the one that uh, really reverberates with the staff is flooding because 
they have experienced it and they know about it. And while I might get some blank stares when I talk about heat, particularly in non-urban areas, I get nodding heads when I talk about floods. Um, but at the same time, connecting floods to climate change. So floods and health, I think there is a connection. I think Deborah made a good point in terms of the mental health aspect. I think particularly because we have such a short attention span, mental health is much more of a chronic condition. There was actually a study done after Hurricane Katrina where um, they followed a little over 800 people who were impacted by the hurricane and they uh, wanted to see if there were any mental health conditions that were being measured. And they looked at them five to eight months and then a year and the numbers actually increased. And then 12 years later, mental health providers were still seeing a lot of cognitive uh, disabilities in people who were impacted by Katrina. So those mental health impacts are extremely chronic and um, Maybe, you know, now that on, on a national level with the wildfires, because it's a similar impact, right? It's just a different disaster. Um, with the hurricanes, um, you know, maybe there's a shift, but I, I think that there still needs to be more work in connecting floods to climate change. Um, the, the Metropolitan uh, Mayor's Caucus is an organization that represents, I think, 275 municipalities in the Chicagoland area. And they have this initiative called the Greenest, um, the Greenest City Compact, uh, the Greenest Region Compact, I think. And the whole Region. idea, mm -hmm. thank, yeah. thank you. <laughs> and the whole idea is centered around sustainability and there are different um, components and climate is one of them, adaptation, mitigation, and resilience. So, you know, I, I think it's definitely on the radar. I think there needs to be more work though, um, especially uh, not at necessarily the leadership position, but, or roles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I will tell you what prompted me to ask that question very quickly. I, I had a, uh, about the, the dots between the increased flooding and climate change. Uh, the reason was that I had a, a neighbor a few blocks from me say to me, now this was about a year ago, we're so fortunate that we don't feel the of climate change here. And I, I was rather shocked by the statement. I, 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 I said, I don't know, we've had a fair amount of flooding, you know, over the past several years in our neighborhood. And she said, well, yeah, there's flooding. So, um, yeah. Some dots connected, maybe some more that have yet to happen. Um, I, so we're talking about this lasting impact. I wanted to ask. I'm, I wanted to oh, ask yes. to answer that to that. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to um, stop. Oh no, no, please. That, um, you won't hear me. One of the more um, one thing that's overlooked is that people that live in the neighborhoods know. They may not know the science of it. They may not know you know, the history of it, but if they live in areas um, that were next to steel mills, that were next to farming, um, industrial farming, um, they know, they know that the cancers, um, the weird illnesses are coming from their environment. They just don't know the science. And the people who do know the science don't live in those areas. And really, don't have to connect because they're far removed. Um, I share, um, I'm, well, with COVID, I'm in Georgia, but I'm usually in Chicago or Georgia. People leave their car doors open and their phones on top of their um, dashboards and the doors are, you know, unlocked and go into the store. In Chicago, you couldn't do that. So it's the same kind of mentality with a person that lives on in a suburb or the north side where they don't have to experience certain things um, the way people in Pilsen or South Chicago um, will experience it. So black, brown, indigenous people know, poor people know, um, more wealthy or middle-class people don't have to think about it 
but there's a push that they are aware of it now and maybe can make um, those changes. So it's, it's, a, it's a social thing as much as um, uh, uh, having empathy and awareness also. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to add on to that, the Center for Neighborhood Technology has been doing a lot of great education um, with different communities who are really uh, uh, having tons of basement flooding. And uh, in one of those communities in Chatham, I remember having a conversation with one of the gentlemen and he was making the connection to, he realized that they cut down their tree in their backyard and then all of a sudden they started experiencing more flooding. And, and I think it's just, you know, people do see it, you know, and they, they understand what's happening with some of the infrastructure. But I think a lot of people are just very used to it, unfortunately. Um, and I think it has been something that if it happens in one neighborhood and doesn't happen in another neighborhood, it's not something that has been um, really brought to everyone's attention. So I'm hoping with climate change becoming more uh, part of our vocabulary that we will start looking at it equitably and how the impacts of it really do affect um, some neighborhoods more than others. You know, for these communities that are the hardest hit, the most vulnerable communities, I'm thinking about, you know, the Space to Grow program is such a partnership. So many partners and um, the criteria for selecting the communities uh, are among the most vulnerable. And I'm, I'm wondering if there are generally, are there partners, you know, dealing with changes, you know, all hands on deck kind of thing. Are there more partners, types of partners that would be useful in these efforts, in these stormwater mitigation efforts, but just haven't been tapped yet or haven't been tapped to their fullest yet to expand what's already happening? Well, I, I would like to answer that um, one of the things that we've seen with the installation of a lot of green infrastructure is that it needs actually to be maintained and cared for. Um, and especially that there's been so many pilot projects for the installation of green stormwater infrastructure. There's been no real um, push to develop a, a maintenance plan long term to and make sure that what you're putting in there is taken care of. And primarily, I'm talking about a lot of the green part of the green infrastructure being the plants, the trees. Um, and, and unfortunately, a lot of times that falls onto the community, which I think is not just because, you know, they don't have maybe sometimes the expertise, the time, or even the ability to take something like that on. And so one of the things that we are working on with the city of Chicago right now is that there's nine different departments um, being led uh, to start having these conversations about where is the green stormwater infrastructure that we've put in the ground, um, mapping it together, being able to see, does it make sense to connect it? Does it make sense to build more in one neighborhood than another? And then ultimately how to create jobs under green stormwater infrastructure so that people can maintain that because not only is it holding water, but it's beautifying places. It's adding, you know, uh, it's purifying the air in those communities uh, wherever we're putting this in. And so it's such a strong investment that we are already putting into um, this that we need to kind of develop the next technology on how to make sure that this becomes more of the fabric of the city. So, excellent. Thank you, Daniela. I, I see that we have questions um, coming in. Meg has yeah. been collecting them. Um, so, let's see. Do you want me to just pull yeah, them out, Christine? I'm not Is seeing that them. Yeah. I 
That is okay. That's what my, my job is to not look pretty on the screen, <laughs> but instead monitor the chat. Um, so I'm going to kind of go um, backwards, everyone. We're going to try to get to your questions um, as, as time allows. Um, but this first question is for Mashani. Do you feel like working on this project has helped connect people in the neighborhood you live to the science at all? Um, I, if it wasn't for COVID, I think that there would have been more reach because the plan was to do workshops um, to create a um, like a newsletter in paper form. Um, to get information out there and have dialogue. And COVID pretty much stopped that um, with personal transitions and then just the general transitions. Um, it's something that we're still working on for future um, parts of Third Coast. Uh, but while my work in the past has focused on environmental issues and I do see where people ask questions and they're more, they're interested in why certain things happen, um, why recycling works or doesn't work, um, what's the point in doing it. Um, different things that I've worked on, I've gotten a lot of feedback and, and dialogue from. So I think it, I think it does open up people. Um, even if it's 10 people, that's enough because they'll talk to 10 people and it will just spread on and on and on. So yeah, I do think it um, will have an effect in the community. So I'm gonna combine kind of two um, more similar questions, kind of about the, one is a little bit about the politically progressive nature in Chicago. I'm gonna read both of them and then I'll just kind of combine them because I think they can go together. So, um, I really do enjoy this. Chicago is not so politically progressive, so politically progress, progress, as politically progressive as some people may think. My students, for example. How can we make climate issues more of a high profile issue for local politics and poli for local politics and politicians? And this kind of dovetails to um, a question that um, a freshman at Columbia College wrote is I'm from Evanston, so I've had plenty of experience with flooding basements. As Deborah said, the water situation in the Midwest will only become more severe and we can only do so much water damage prevention. So what in the meantime is Third Coast Disrupted doing to prevent the water um, situation from getting worse? I've learned that to make the biggest um, impact is to pass proposals in the legislature. Um, have you written any proposals um, in the city or Chicago or Illinois um, that can be um, to help kind of mitigate climate change? Um, or is there kind of an idea of um, doing something like this in the future? So I think really both of these are about significant and substantial political action. And maybe you guys can um, speak to that for a second. Well, I'll speak. I'll speak to the part about what Third Coast Disrupted is doing about it. Um, the intention of Third Coast Disrupted Artists and Scientists on Climate is to, oh, am I unmuted? Oh, thanks for unmuting me, Meg. Um, the ultimate goal of Third Coast Disrupted is to spur climate action by getting people talking about climate change. Climate scientists tell us that the most important climate action is talking about climate change because if we don't care, if we don't talk about it, we don't care if we don't care about if we don't care, we don't act. But to move that bigger political uh, agenda, we also need people talking about it. We need to spread that conversation. So the purpose of these artworks, the conversation is the heart is at the heart of the project. So we had artists and scientists talking about climate change impacts and solutions. So we need to be thinking about the solutions and keep giving people hope. That's a part of the action. Um, then the artworks themselves, uh, because they connect with people on a visceral level can get people talking about climate change as well. So what, in terms of what Third Coast Disrupted is doing for climate action, that's where we're focused. I'll let others talk about the, the other political considerations. 
I'm looking at Deborah in case you want to say anything. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> there are several dimensions to this. One is the Water Reclamation District is a large agency with a large uh, territory. We have a billion dollar budget and the board is embarking on a strategic planning initiative with senior staff. We have a draft climate action plan. Uh, we're developing a sustainability and resiliency plan. And I think the, the, there's interest and some at the agency to move towards uh, carbon zero uh, energy and so forth. Uh, and to generate our own energy, to reuse water, to capture and recover a lot of the resources in the waste stream. So there's things we're doing. We're funding a lot of stormwater projects, both to um, mitigate flooding and try to reduce future flooding around Cook County. But I think what Christine pointed out, and Elena has a lot of experience with, is it's telling stories. And so the story of your repeated flooded basement, of the, the tree removed from a backyard and what happened afterward. When I first ran for office 15 years ago, I told the story of our driveway in Skokie, which is asphalt. And we calculated how much rain runs off into the street. It's between nine and 10,000 gallons a year of essentially fresh water delivered free of charge right to our doorstep that as soon as it runs into the street becomes contaminated and runs, goes into a sewer, mixes with sewage. We send it to a sewage treatment plant, but after the solid waste is separated from the liquid waste, that treated water is discharged into the Chicago waterways and ends up in the Gulf of Mexico. We don't put it back in the Lake Michigan. How smart is that? So we need to find ways to, as I said, peel away that concrete skin, capture water where it falls. Uh, and I think as I would walk around and carrying a bucket and talking about my driveway, people connect. They know what a driveway is and they can imagine it being converted from asphalt to a permeable surface. Um, I, I feel like there's, I have a couple things to say. Um, one is that I think it's always important to look at previous uh, movements, um, suffrage movement, the civil rights movement, ACT UP, the HIV AIDS movements. You know, they both, ha there was actually a lot of infighting in all of those movements. And there were the people who were about incremental change and we need to sit down and we need to talk with, um, you know, the opposition, so to speak, and we need to write legislation, which takes time. And there were the folks that were like, no, we need to be in the streets. We need to be marching. We need to be in their faces, letting them know, right? ACT UP went to, um, they went to um, churches and cathedrals and had like die-ins basically. And I think it's important to have both. You know, it causes a lot of infighting, but you need both. So you need those incremental changes and you need the, the drastic changes as well. Um, you know, I heard a, a climate change communication expert once say, a Republican strategist said, you say it once, you say it again, you say it a third time, you say it a fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth time. And when you think you've said it enough, you say it again. So we need to keep talking about it because you, you'll start, it'll start seeping into to, um, people's heads, people's minds. And I think we need to stop talking about it as a belief system because it's not, right? We just need to, we're talking about, no, climate change is happening. This is what we're doing. Um, no more debates. Don't even bother with the debates. But at the same time, I think it is important to find common ground with those who might, might disagree with you, right? So I know that I've had um, a number of talks where, particularly with emergency preparedness professionals who are, might say, you know what? I don't actually think that's why we're having more frequent and severe floods. I do think we are having them. And then we have that conversation. Okay, great. We agree with that. What can we do about it? 
And then you actually have a relationship with someone and you start to listen to each other more because you've established a relationship. Hopefully you start listening to each other more. I feel like we're having a listening problem in this country right now, but um, I, you know, I, it's not necessarily going to happen right away and this is how we're gonna do it and done and bam. I also think it's really important that, um, you know, we provide ideas and examples of what individuals can do, right? You can, you can get power efficient um, light bulbs and power efficient power strips and, I'm sorry, energy efficient and, you know, make sure you unplug your toaster or anything that lights up. Yes, it's small. Yes, um, corporations have, you know, contribute more to it. But if you feel empowered, uh, that might then encourage more people. Oh, wait, I actually can do something about this. Let's reach out to decision makers and have, you know, more conversations about it. I'll, I'll write letters, whatever it may be. So um, I don't think, I actually think that providing um, examples of what individuals can do does play a role in getting to the bigger picture. And a lot of our, oh, I'm sorry. sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say a lot of our youth are already doing it. We're just not listening to them because we're older and wiser. And they're pushing it. They're doing the protests, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old. Um, listen to the children because they, they see it. They are going to be living in it. So they're like, you know, you, you, you're you're screwing us over, you know, and stop it. So I think that the youth know um, it's the older generations that have to get with it. And I'd like to say something really quickly too, in terms of conservation and thinking about Chicago in that way. I mean, we do have this public open lakefront. So one of the things, especially with the lake levels being so high, I think a lot, a lot more people are becoming aware of, of those changes and what's happening. I would say the other big thing is, you know, I went to a meeting with environmentalists of color, um, a group here in the Chicago region, and they said, you know, it's great, you know, to go out and plant trees and to volunteer and, and help do some work. Where are the jobs in this? Where, other than just the training program, where are the jobs? And, um, you know, there are, really phenomenal jobs needed, um, uh, needing people right now in water, blue jobs, in green infrastructure jobs, but there needs to be some policy pushing too. So it is kind of like helping to move Chicago a little bit from, you know, sometimes they're, they're used to how they've always been doing things into this new system. And one of the things out there right now is one of the, um, Alderman Waguspak uh, proposed an urban forestry advisory board just to start talking about what we should be doing with the urban canopy. You know, we had this derecho come through wiping out thousands of trees. Every year we've had a net loss of 10,000 trees in Chicago. And if you're thinking about green infrastructure, I mean, that's going to impact the water in our basements right there. And so why not get the best people together to really like it, with community people to actually talk about what do we want in our city instead of like leaving it to, you know, the alderman who wants to give a developer, you know, a, a nice cafe and, you know, take down a tree. There needs to be some internal movement here. And so let's hope that all goes through. Cool. Oh. I feel like our conversation is really just getting started that we're just warming up, but unfortunately uh, time has passed and uh, in respect for everybody's time, I'm afraid we'll have to wrap up. I, I see some really great information coming in through the chat. So um, we will be sending that out when we um, send out the link to the recording of this session as well. I, 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 we were going to ask our panelists to give us a real short um, parting thought before we go, but because we're running long and, and we want to let people get into their evenings, uh, the panelists probably won't be too upset if we don't do those 30 second recaps. So you're off the hook. Uh, this, thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you to all of you who have joined us this evening. This has been 
a really interesting, thought-provoking hour. Um, I hope that you will consider joining us for one of our upcoming programs. We have one next week, Thursday, October 8th, called Avian Effects, Climate Change in Birds. And our last program is October 22nd, Getting Around Carbon, New Looks at Transportation Options. That one is sponsored by the Illinois Science and Energy Innovation Foundation. These two programs, like ours tonight, are, are um, panel discussions, and each has an artist and a scientist, like we had tonight. To learn more about them and to register, you can visit thirdcoastdisrupted.org or column, O-L-U-M, as in short for Columbia, column.edu third coast. You can also focus on climate, as Meg said, which is at the Glass Curtain Gallery, 1104 South Wabash until October 30th. We hope you can see it in person, but if you can't or if you're uncomfortable doing so, as Meg said, we will be um, continually posting more resources so that people can experience it virtually. So thank you again, everyone, and please have a wonderful evening. Good night. Mm -hmm.